We will be tonight in chapters 8 through 10. But before we do that, a couple of quick announcements. I know you're, you're waiting with bated breath, but it's because I'm trying to get my iPad to cooperate and actually open my Bible study. We may have a night of worship and prayer. Hmm. All right, well, Lord, in Jesus' name, thank you for technology. And we ask, there it is, that you would make our technology work for us. All right. A um, couple of quick announcements for the rest of the week. Um, Keep, keep praying about a couple of things. Cultivate is going really well. If you don't know what Cultivate is, it's our summer youth discipleship program. And it's just been really awesome again this year. It's the second year that, that Pastor Adam and Ashley have led this. And I, I think we have about 18 of our junior high and high school students coming. Um, they gather every morning. They have a time of fellowship. They have a time of worship. They're building a worship band. And I have a surprise for you. The last Sunday of July, our Cultivate Youth Worship Band is going to be leading worship here at, on Sunday at our main service. So keep just keep praying for them. Um, lots of good fruit comes from spending an entire summer pouring into the youth. And the fruit may not come today or tomorrow, but sometimes it does. And so it's been just really neat to see what God is doing. And I, I see God building unity and, and, you know, just connection among some of our youth. And it's a sweet, sweet thing that's going on. So just keep praying for them. So uh, that, that happens Wednesday through Friday every week. And we've got a couple more weeks after this week. Friday night at 7 o'clock, of course, is Foundation's Youth Group. This is an Ironworks men's Bible study weekend, so men, 7.30 a.m. this Saturday, Ironworks. Pastor Mark will be back in the saddle again teaching after a little break. Men in Action at 9.45 and then Young Adults at 7 p.m. And just a final announcement, well, I guess a couple. Um, our VBS is coming up in under a month and there's all sorts of opportunities to be involved. If you signed up to provide some of the supplies that were requested for our VBS, uh, I believe this Sunday, Chris, this coming Sunday is, is the deadline. We need those supplies in so that we can start preparing them for the VBS. And um, Chris still has lots of opportunities for anybody who wants to serve. So if you want to serve at our summer VBS, just go to the VBS booth in the fellowship hall after the service. And then the summer, I'm sorry, the Deep South Calvary Chapel Youth Conference is coming up later in the summer. And tonight is the absolute last night to sign up. So moms and dads, if you want your kids to go and you have not yet signed them up, uh, please do so. And this is a great example. Look at the screen right now. See that little let number going by? In case you don't know this, if that is the little number that they gave you when you dropped your child off at the children's ministry, that means you need to go back and check on your children, okay? All right, would you do me a favor? One last thing, check your electronic devices. Make sure that anything you carried into the sanctuary that could possibly distract what God is gonna be doing among us tonight be uh, silenced, whether it be electronic or you know, however other, but just, uh, yes. I'm really sorry to interrupt, but I just want to let you know it says ladies' Bible study in there. There's no ladies' Bible study. There's no ladies' Bible study this week. That's right. Thanks, Betty Ann. So make sure that your electronic devices are on silent because I believe that God's going to really speak to us tonight from the book of Job. Um, on Wednesday nights, I think you know this, but we go verse by verse through the Old Testament. And tonight we find ourselves at Job chapters 8 through 10 with a message we're going to call the Bildad School of Biblical Counseling. You remember last week was the Eliphaz School of Biblical Counseling. Next week, can anybody prophetically guess what the message title might be? 
the Zophar School of Biblical Counseling. All right, free coffee for both of you after the service tonight at the free coffee station, okay? So, but, but as, we, as we look tonight at chapters 8 through 10 in the book of Job, my prayer for you over these last few days as I've been studying and preparing is that God would meet with you and I right where we are tonight. In fact, he does that all the time, but I, I just really been praying that we'd be so aware of that tonight, that right where we're at, God would speak to us from these chapters, that he would lead us, that he would guide us, that he would direct us, that he'd give us wisdom in the midst of whatever you're going through right now, whether it be a trial or whether it be a season of extreme excitement and victory, that God would give us wisdom to be able to really be right where he wants us to be. So just a quick review. If you remember in chapters 1 and 2, we watched as Satan came to God and he said, you know, I've noticed your, your servant Job. I have set my eyes upon him. I, I have picked him out. He's my latest project, Satan would say to God. And what he says is, you know, God, you've protected him. You've prof prospered him. But I know that if you were to afflict him and you were to take away everything that he has that Job would curse you and so God gave Satan permission to test Job's integrity and in just a very short time the period of one day Job lost all of his earthly possessions and he ended up homeless we saw in chapter 2 that he was living at the city dump Satan comes along and, and brings a whirlwind that knocks over a house and Job's ten children died. And then a little bit later we saw that Job even lost the support of his wife. The, the woman that had made a, a covenant with him to be his helpmate finally looks at him and says, you know, Job, do you still hang on to your integrity? Just curse God and die. So, so you know, Job is just going downhill. But he still didn't curse God. So Satan got permission a second time and he afflicted Job with this disease that caused very painful boils, both on the inside and the outside of his body. A very, very nasty disease. And yet Job still refuses to curse God. So as we get to the end of chapter 2, we find that Job's three friends travel from far away. They come and their goal was to minister to him. We read in chapter 2 that as they came, they wanted only to mourn with him and they wanted to comfort him. And so following the cultural norms of the day, they sat in silence with him for seven days, waiting for him to speak. And unfortunately, as we got to chapter 3, Job did speak, and he made a huge mistake. This was a very huge stumble. He even said that in our Bible study last week. You see, he thought he could trust these friends. He thought that they were close enough friends that they loved him and they understood him. That actually wasn't the case. And so as Job pours out his heart and he really reveals what's going on in the depths of his heart in the midst of these trials, he says some things that his friends just could not deal with. He, he questioned God and then he ultimately said that he wished he was dead. He said, I wish I wouldn't have been born. I wish I could die. You know, I've been pursuing and desiring death, but God just won't cooperate. And uh, his friends couldn't handle that real well. And so what they did, and, and this is a majority of the rest of the book of Job, is rather than comfort him and encourage him and just mourn with him, they began to examine him and they began to analyze him. And tonight, as you'll see, they'll continue to rebuke him. And, you know, as I was preparing this, I started thinking, you know, with this many people in one room, what are the chances that a great number of people walked in here tonight dealing with similar things? Maybe not nearly as bad, but I wonder how many people walked in here tonight and, and we're in the midst of some really heavy trials. I wonder how many people walked in here tonight questioning God, maybe responding badly to God. I wonder how many people in here have poured out their hearts to somebody and then wished that they hadn't and you're feeling a little bit foolish because in the midst of your circumstances you know you may have stumbled a brother or maybe you've got a brother or a sister who's speaking to you based on what you said and they've misinterpreted really 
where you are, I'm really hoping and praying and sensing that God's going to meet you right where you are tonight, and God is going to speak to you, and he is going to minister to you. So last week, we looked at chapters 4 through 7, and we saw that Eliphaz, the Temanite, he spoke to Job, and he accused Job of two things, and the first was hypocrisy. He told Job that God only punishes the guilty, that God does not punish the upright, and therefore he, he kind of surmised that Job must have hidden sin in his life, that if Job would just simply, simply you know, confess and repent, everything would be okay. And then he told Job also that he was being unteachable. He said that Job was resisting God's discipline, and Job communicated back, and he said, you know, I've, I've examined my heart, I've examined my life, and truthfully, I have found nothing. I cannot find anything in my life that I believe is bad enough that the Lord would respond to me with these kinds of punishments. And so before we get into the first verse of chapter 8, I want to remind you of three principles that we've gleaned so far from the book of Job because they will come into play week after week. We're going to put these up on the screen here. Three principles that we have learned from the book of Job. And the, and the first is, in very small letters, <laughs> there's always more going on than meets the eye. We learned that from chapters 1 and 2. You got something crazy going on in your life right now? Take a step back. Prayerfully consider what's going on, and I bet you're going to find that you are in the midst of spiritual warfare. Maybe you are in this time of growth or this time of effectiveness. Maybe your marriage is thriving. Maybe your kids are growing in the Lord. Maybe you're witnessing to your neighbors or at work, and Satan or one of his, his minions looks at your situation and says, no, 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 this will never do. And they decide that they are going to level an attack against you. There is always more going on than meets the eye. Paul told us that we oftentimes misinterpret these things as flesh against flesh. Okay, I'm mad at Keith because Keith did this. Well, Paul says, hold on a minute. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against, and he said, principalities and powers and authorities and all these other demonic entities. The second principle that our Bible study will build on tonight we saw in chapter 3 that even the godliest people can become irrational when they're in the midst of suffering. What did we learn about Job in chapter 1? He was upright in all of his ways. He was like one of God's human heroes, so to speak, if, if that's possible to say. He was one of those human beings that God wasn't scared to brag on. Not even to Satan. Hey, Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Right? Even the most godly people can become irrational when they're in the midst of suffering. And you know what this means? This means that when you're not the person who has become irrational in the midst of suffering, that you've got to remember that sometimes people become irrational. And, and, and when they are irrational, that is not the time to exercise the spiritual gift of condemnation, such as Job's friends did. And then the last principle, and then we'll get into our study. We learned in chapters 4 through 7 as we studied Job and we studied Bildad, I'm sorry, um, Eliphaz speaking to Job. And that's that well-meaning people often jump to conclusions when examining other people's misfortunes, and then they offer hurtful counsel. Remember last week, basically Eliphaz came along and he said, you know, Job, there's only one explanation for all this, and that's that you've got hidden sin in your life, and brother, you need to repent so God can bless you again. And that is so often what happens in the church when people are just going through a tough time. Someone comes along, exercises their gift of rebuke, and all of a sudden you've got a believer in the church who now believes that Christians are the only ones who shoot their own wounded. And for good reason, they feel that way. We want to make sure that we don't go down that road. So tonight, we're going to see this third principle in action. This well-meaning people often jump to conclusions when examining other people's misfortunes, and then they offer hurtful counsel. We're going to see this in action tonight, because Bildad is going to counsel Job, and he's going to do a absolutely terrible job. So if you'll pray with me, we'll dig into our text. Lord, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful that we can come to you and we can open your word and, and we can expect that the author of creation, the one who spoke and everything that we see came into existence, the one who took us and knit us together in our mother's womb, that 
person, you, you're speaking to us tonight. You're going to teach us tonight. And we are going to know you better and we are going to be better loved and better able to love as we take these three chapters and we learn, we make them part of us. We just ask, Lord, come and teach us tonight. And then, Lord, by your Spirit, give us the ability to choose to walk in the counsel of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to break chapter 8 into two sections. The first half is verses 1 through 10. And we're going to say here that Bildad made some inaccurate observations. That's what we're about to see. Bildad comes along and he makes some assumptions about Job's life and Job's situation that are very inaccurate. And it starts here in verse 1, then Bildad the Shuhite, and I got to say this, Pastor Mark asked me to say this, who was the shortest man in the Bible? Bildad, why? Because he was only Shuhite. So for the rest of the night, we're going to call him Little Bill, okay? So verse 1, then Little Bill, no, we're not going to do that. Bildad the Shuhite answered, and he said, How long will you speak these things? And the words of your mouth be like a strong wind. Now I want to examine two things that Bildad said in his opening sentence. He says here, how long will you speak these things? He, he was specifically referring to something, and we find it, if we'll back up just a little bit to chapter 7, verse 20, and, and we'll read 21, just the first sentence. But, but Job is speaking to God. At the end of chapter 7, he, he's speaking to God, and he says, Have I sinned? What have I done to you, O watcher of men? Why <clears throat> have you set me as your target? that I am a burden to myself. Why then do you not pardon my transgression and take away my iniquity? And so Job is in this situation. He cries out to God in chapter 7. Then here at the beginning of chapter 8, Bildad comes and he says, Job, how long are you going to maintain your innocence before God? We all know you're guilty. Why don't you just simply confess your sins and we'll move on to the next phase of this thing where God starts blessing you again. And then the second thing he says this, he says, how long will you speak these things and the words of your mouth be like a strong wind? This whole words of your mouth are like a strong wind. This is what Bildad is saying. In order to understand it, you have to remember back to chapter one where a strong wind was used by Satan to destroy a house and it killed Job's ten children. And with that as our context, Bildad is saying, Job, you know, you're using an abundance of words to say that you're innocent before God. Let, let's just be honest here. Do you ever talk to somebody who just doesn't know when to quit? Do you ever meet that person, they, you feel like you're just backed into a corner and they just go on and on and on and they don't really say a whole lot or they say the same thing over and over and over and you feel like your hair's being blown back, you know, like those old Bose commercials with the guy sitting in the chair and the volume up and his hair's going straight back, you know. Do you ever feel like that? You just get cornered by people and, and you're just like, time out, you know, take a breather. Can I say two words? And you say two words and then they go for 15 minutes again. This is what... Job is being accused of by Bildad. Bildad is saying, don't you ever shut up? All you ever do is talk about how righteous you are. You're constantly giving examples of your righteousness. You're telling us there's no way that you are unrighteous. Job, you realize that you are not anything but a big windbag and everybody sees right through you. And Job, if you continue talking like this, your words will just condemn you in the end. Now, How's that for an opening of a chapter? I mean, can you imagine? Here you are, you're sitting on an ash heap, you're scraping your sores that have maggots living in them. You're, you're, you're as bad as a person can be physically and emotionally. You're crying out for death, and your comforter comes along and says this, you're guilty and we all know it. And the second thing is, you talk way too much. And every time you talk, all you talk about is how you're innocent. But we know you're not innocent. And we also know that because of your many words, God is going to judge you. And your very words will be your end. I love you, brother. 
this is what's going on here. He's not just downright rude. He's uncompassionate and he's brash. And he's talking to a man who has just lost everything, thinking that he's bringing comfort. And he has not done anything but just continue to hurt Job. And as we go from verse 1 and 2 into verse 3, he makes his most inaccurate assessment of Job. If you'll look at verse 3, he says, Does God subvert judgment? Or does the Almighty pervert justice? If your sons have sinned against him, he has cast them away for their transgression. Bildad comes along and he says, Job, we need to remember that God's judgment is flawless and he is perfect in how he administers justice. So Job, what you need to understand here is that your sons were destroyed by God because they were living in open and unrepentant, willful sin against him. I love you, brother, but I got to speak these words of truth. And, and you know, you and I look at this and we say, did he really just say that? Did he really just say, Job, God killed your sons because they're a bunch of rebels? Bildad was thinking that he was taking a little bit of heat and pressure off of Job because last week we saw that Eliphaz came along and he said, Job, Everybody knows that your sons were killed because of your sin, and this guilt is upon you. So Bildad comes along and he says, Job, I'm going to make you feel better. It's not your fault. You don't have to bear the guilt of your sons being killed for your, son, your sin. Your sons were killed for the guilt of their sin. And I can imagine that Job is just sitting there going, Lord, how about I take this piece of pottery shard that I'm scratching my own wounds with and how about I wound my friend you know can you imagine and we're only four verses into it and then look what he does he continues making some other assumptions he says if you would earnestly seek God and make your supplication to the Almighty if you were pure and upright surely now he would awake for you and prosper you or your rightful dwelling place Though your beginning was small, your latter end would increase abundantly. This guy's just a master of words here, but he says a couple of things. The first, he says, Job, even if you are praying, my brother, God's not listening to you. The skies are like bronze for you because God doesn't listen to the sins, I mean, to the prayers of unrepentant sinners. And the second thing is, is Job, if you just confess your sin, God would forgive you. He'd reverse all these things that have happened to you and your future would be even more prosperous than your past. And, you know, you can see everything that he's saying has a bit of truth mixed in with a bit of error. We, we said this last week about Eliphaz. Eliphaz had partially right theology mixed with 100% wrong application. And that's why he was a terrible minister to Job. Look at verse 8. He says, For inquire, please, of the former age, and consider the things discovered by their fathers. For, you, for we were born yesterday and, and know nothing, because our days on earth are a shadow. Will they not teach you and tell you and utter words from their heart? Now, this is one of those texts that's a little bit hard to understand, but if you really dig into it, you find that, that what Bildad is saying, he's saying, Job, look at us three friends of yours. We're old men. But compared to the men who have gone before us, we were born yesterday. And what he's communicating is that there are men who have been communicating wisdom and truth generation after generation after generation. And we have the benefit of learning from all these sages and all this wisdom that they've given forth. So Job, you need to listen to us because we really know what we're talking about. And Job, this is our counsel. Your kids suffered for their sin. You're suffering because of your sin. And if you would just confess and repent, God would heal you. And doesn't that all just sound so good? Doesn't that all sound so modern? This is just the, this is the counsel that Christians give each other in the pews every Sunday. You know, what's going on? It's just been a really rough week. Well, I noticed when I saw you going down the road the other day, you were speeding. Maybe God's holding you accountable for that. Are you watching 24 again in the evenings instead of reading your Bible, brother? This is probably what's going on. You, you know, you're, you're getting really fleshly. You're... Man, 
let me pray for you, okay? And, and, and you got this person in church looking at you going, from now on, I am not confiding in you. I am never talking to you about my problems again. And that's why there's so many plastic Christians. They walk into church, how you doing? What they want to say is, man, I'm, I'm like an inch from death. And they go, I'm great, how are you? What side are you sitting on? Left side, I'm going to the right, you know. It's why it happens this way in church, because believers jump to conclusion, just like Bildad did. Now watch what happens. He goes from jumpy to conclusions about his brother's life to now making some really hurtful accusations, verses 11 through 22. He says some interesting things. He says, can the papyrus grow up without a marsh? Can the reeds flourish without water? While it is yet green and not cut down, it withers before any other plant. Verse 13, and so are the paths of all who forget God. Do you see what he's doing? He's using what you and I would cause, call um, cause and effect, and it's a very serious mistake to make in the spiritual realm of somebody else's life. You can't just walk up to somebody and they share with you that they're going through a deep trial and you go into cause and effect mode, okay? He comes and he basically says this, Job, let's reason this out, okay? Let's reason this out. Can a plant continue to grow when it's not in the right environment? No. Can a plant continue to grow when it has no water? No. If a plant is growing and you deprive it of water, does it wither and die? Yes. Now, Job, from your own mouth, and what he does is he comes and he says, Job, you're not thriving. You're not thriving because you have forgotten and forsaken God. You've forgotten his ways. You have forsaken walking with him. And as a result, Job, you are withering away. And it gets even worse. Look what else he says. He says, the hope of the hypocrite shall perish, whose confidence shall be cut off and whose trust is a spider's web. He leans on his house, but it does not stand. He holds it fast, but it does not endure. He grows green in the sun and his branches spread out in his garden. His roots wrap around the rock heap and look for a place in the stones. If he is destroyed from his place, then it will deny him saying, I have not seen you. It's just a lot of words for Bildad to say to Job, Job, you're not only a hypocrite, but you've lost your hope in God because of your hypocrisy. Now you're turning to God for help and you're finding that he's not there for you. Why? Well, my friend, we all know that God does not help hypocrites. And here's the picture. Look at this little phrase he, share, he, sh uh, he shares. He says, whose confidence shall be cut off and whose trust is a spider's web. Picture yourself walking down the road. You know, you trip. And as you're getting ready to fall, you see a spider's web and you think, oh, I'll grab it, you know. It'll hold me up. You reach for it, and what happens? You've got no strength. You fall on your face, and you think, huh, I expected it to catch me. That's not nearly as bad as when you're walking and a spider web wraps around. Do you ever have that happen? It happened in our camping trip last weekend. I walked between two trees, and the spider web just right around my face, and I danced like a crazy man. <laughs> but I didn't scream, because there were people watching. He's basically saying, Job, because of your hypocrisy, you're reaching out to God for help, and what you're finding is he's not there. He's not there for you, Job. God is not there to help hypocrites. And then verse 19, he says, Behold, this is the joy of his way, and out of the earth others will grow. Behold, God will not cast away the blameless, nor will he uphold the evildoers. He will yet fill your mouth with laughing and your lips with rejoicing. Those who hate you will be clothed with shame, and the dwelling place of the wicked will come to nothing. Now, now these are his closing words. And it's like he's saying, okay, now, Job, let, let me summarize everything that I've said in just a few words. And, and in verses 19 through 21, he, he gives like his first summary, and he says, Job, it's possible that you can one day again experience joy and laughter like you once did, but first, you must repent. You've got to confess the secret sin that you're involved with so that God can forgive you and restore you. And then verse 22, he says, Job, 
The only way you'll be vindicated from the people that are accusing you, and I find this extremely bothering and concerning, that the man who's accusing him, who's sitting next to the last guy that really accused him, is saying to him, the only way that you'll be able to really vindicate yourself against your accusers is if you were to confess your sins and repent. And, and then it'll be like you're heaping coals on their head. He says the dwelling place of the wicked will come to nothing. In other words, the wicked people that accuse you, you know, you'll prove that they're absolutely wrong. You'll flourish and they'll go to their grave. Can you believe a man has the audacity to say these kinds of things? He's sitting here railing on Job and then he turns around and says these kinds of things. And it's just really bothering. It's really bothersome. It's very concerning that you see this guy who claims to love Job. He said, you know, from chapter 2, their motive was to come and to comfort Job, to just sit and mourn with him, to, to just be there for a brother. But as soon as they heard that Job had some yuckiness in his heart and his heart was just overflowing with yuckiness, these guys decide that it's their job as representatives of God. They're playing the role of the Holy Spirit. Job, we've got to fix you. And I said it last week, I'm going to say it this week, I'm going to say it next week. When people are this hurt, they don't need to be fixed. This is not the time to fix somebody. When somebody has just gotten the worst news of their life, somebody you love has passed away, oh no, it's cancer. I'm sorry, there's nothing else we can do but make them comfortable. Whatever the, whatever the news is that comes that brings a person to the low point, and then back to one of our principles, even the most godly people lose it sometimes during these times, that is not the time to rebuke. That is not the time to correct. How many of you have ever said something stupid or that you didn't even believe in the midst of hurting? I know I have. I don't know. How, I told Kelly one time, you know what? I'm not even called to ministry. I'm not going back. You know, and I meant it at the moment. But at the exact same time, I knew I'm just venting. I just had a bad day. One too many people slept through the Sunday service, and I got offended, you know, and I'm just, this is, I'm not called to this. At Greg Laurie's church and, you know, Franklin Graham, they get up and preach, and people do somersaults down the aisle, you know. Raul Reese sneezes, and 100 people get saved. I give an altar call, and people get up and go to the bathroom, okay? It was one of those days. And I told Kelly, I'm done. I, this is not my call. I'm going back to fixing Toyotas. And she just smiled at me. I just love my wife. My wife is very gifted. She very rarely plays a Bildad or a, an Eliphaz or a Zophar. That's usually me, unfortunately. But. You know, that's not the time that we rebuke each other. That's not the time we correct each other. You know what we do? We, we wrap our arms around each other and we just say, bro, I'm just here for you. If, you know, Proverbs says that it's not wise to vent. Only the fool vents all his feelings. But if you need to be foolish for a couple of hours, I'll sit here and I'll forget everything you said. And when you're ready to move forward, man, I'm going to lock arms with you and here we go. This guy did just the opposite. He looked at his brother who was down, who was hurting, who had suffered. You know, I don't know if there's many humans who have suffered as much as Job suffered besides Jesus. And this guy looks and he says, you know, Job, let me tell you what your problem is. That's a bad place to be. And, and I want to show you the results of this kind of ungodly counsel. It's the next two chapters. We're going to see that Job, Job begins to wrestle. And what Job is doing is he's about to start wrestling and contending with God. Now, if these guys would have come and just said, you know, Job, we're here for you. We love you. We're going to pray for you. What can we do? Things would have been very different. But Job now, he's getting beat up by his friends. Bad counsel. He starts to wrestle and contend with God. So in chapter 9, we begin to see how a person's thought patterns get kind of crazy when they're looking for answers in the midst of deep trials. Now, if God sends you through a trial, if God allows the enemy to take you through deep things, I don't suggest you look at Job as your pattern of how to properly respond. Because I don't think Job responded properly. But at the same time, we have to have a little bit of understanding that sometimes when people are going through this much hurt, they just get a little bit crazy for a while. 
and their pendulum swings from side to side. Sometimes it seems like it's going to go all the way around. And we're about to see Job go through these crazy emotional swings in chapter 9. Just as we read this, look at Job's emotional swings. A couple of times he just, he gets right back to center. He's just like speaking perfect truth. And then all of a sudden he's out in left field and then he's off in right field. Just check this out. Then Job answered and he said, truly, I know it is so. And what he's saying here, he's responding to the entire body of information that Bildad communicated to him. In a sense, what he's saying, he's saying, listen, Bildad, I agree that God does bless the upright, and I do agree that God disciplines those who forsake him and forsake his ways. But my friend, that makes my situation all the more confusing because I'm an innocent man. I have devoted my life to righteous living. When I've had a stumble, I've quickly repented and made the appropriate offerings. I do not see anything in my life or in the lives of my children that would warrant this kind of a response or discipline or punishment from God, from this God that I have always known to be merciful and patient and loving and gracious. And Job just says, I, I agree. God blesses the upright. He punishes those who deserve it. And I don't know what to think about my situation because I'm in the midst of some deep stuff and I know I haven't done anything wrong. And so he asks this question. He says, how can a man be righteous before God? And it's very important that we understand what Job is saying here. What Job is trying to communicate here in this short sentence is he's saying that I've lived my life with integrity. Uh, I've lived upright and, and holy before the Lord. And again, when I've stumbled, I've very quickly repented. I've made the appropriate offering, if God doesn't look at my life and count me as righteous, then I don't know what it takes to be considered righteous in his eyes. Now, the pendulum's kind of swinging, isn't it? Job is kind of sticking his chest out a little bit spiritually. He's saying, I'm probably one of the most righteous men on the planet. I'm, I'm one of the most righteous men that I know, definitely, Job is saying. And he's saying, if God is still punishing me, and if everything we know about him is true, then, then, then what does it take to please this kind of a God? And, and what, you know, what are we going to do about this? So now the pendulum really swings. Hold on to your hat, because notice what Job is going to do. You want to talk about the pendulum swinging. He goes like this. If one wished to contend with him, he could not answer him one time out of a thousand. Look at the first sentence. Job basically says, you know what? I'm ready to, I'm ready to rumble. I'm ready to rumble with God. You know, I don't understand what he's doing, so let's do this. I am going to contend with God. And this word contend, it's a Hebrew word that describes how a lawsuit is conducted. And Job is basically saying this, let's call God into the courtroom and let's put him on the witness stand and let's ask him a couple of really, really hard questions. Like number one, let's make him tell us why he's caused all this trouble to happen to me. And then second of all, let's get God to acknowledge that I'm not a hypocrite, that I'm not this person with all this hidden sin in my life. And then the pendulum swings to the other side. Look what he says. But he could not answer him one time out of a thousand. In other words, he says, okay, once we put God on the stand and we hit him with these hard questions, he's then going to cross-examine us or me. And he says, if, if God were to do that to me or any other man, I couldn't answer one out of a thousand questions or accusations that he would make against me. In fact, I would only prove just how little I know when God started asking me these questions. And with the pendulum still on that side, he says, God is wise in heart and mighty in strength. Who has hardened himself against him and prospered? He removes the mountains and they do not know when he overturns them in his anger. He shakes the earth out of its place and its pillars tremble. He commands the sun and it does not rise. He seals off the stars. He alone spreads out the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. He made the bear, Orion, and the Pleiades, 
and the chambers of the South. He does great things past finding out. Yes, wonders without number. If he goes by me, I do not see him. If he moves past, I do not perceive him. If he takes away, who can hinder him? Who can say to him, what are you doing? God will not withdraw his anger. The allies of the proud lie prostrate beneath him. How then can I answer him and choose my words to reason with him? Anybody starting to see a little bit of kooky or cuckoo going on in, in Job? Cuckoo, cuckoo, right? He starts out, he says, you know what? I'm going to give God a piece of my mind. Let's put him on the stand. He's on the spot. And then all of a sudden he kind of comes to his senses and he goes, this is God, the creator of everything. He created me. He created the world. He created the, the universe and the stars and the sky and bears and, and the chambers of the south and, and anybody who kind of goes against him, ends up dead meat. And, and, and then he says in verse 14, how then can I answer him and choose my words to reason with him? This is what happens when a person is going through deep, deep stuff and people don't come and comfort, but rather they make accusations, the person begins to get a little bit crazy because they're trying to say, maybe I am the problem. I don't see anything that warrants this kind of a response from God, but maybe I'm just blind to my own sin. You know, one second they're going, God, I, you need to tell me, you know, why are you doing this? And the next second, the person is just going, hold on a minute, man, this is the God of the universe. Nobody questions him. He can do anything he wants. Another emotional swing occurs here in verse 15, but this one is way more balanced. He says, for though I were righteous... I could not answer him. I would beg mercy of my judge. See, here's, here's Job back to the balance uh, of maybe hearing from the Spirit or walking in the Spirit. He says, listen, I, I know that I'm innocent of these charges, but that doesn't give me the right to question God. That doesn't give me the right to contend with him. And, and you know, I don't see anything wrong with my life, but maybe God sees something differently. So instead of me talking about my righteousness, look at the end of the verse. He says, I'm just going to beg mercy of him because he's my judge. So he, he comes back to this place of lucidity and, and he's kind of back to the center again. And in verse 16, he says, if I called and he answered me, I would not believe that he was listening to my voice. For he crushes me with a tempest, and he multiplies my wounds without cause. He will not allow me to catch my breath, but he fills me with bitterness. Here we're seeing another result of a person who's going through deep things, who's not treated with compassion and love and grace and mercy by his fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, but, but rather is given that, you know, you must have hidden sin, brother. Look what he says. I really want to tune in to the last sentence of verse 17, or the whole verse 17, I guess. He crushes me with a tempest, and he multiplies my wounds without cause. Job is basically saying, God has done this to me. I don't understand why, I probably never will understand why, but God, my creator, has done this to me. We know from chapter one that God was not responsible for this, Satan was. But look at the, the way that Satan plays a set of circumstances and brings them together with the unwise words of a non-praying, non-Bible reading counselor. And all of a sudden, Job goes, I'm the victim of God's anger instead of I'm the object of God's grace and mercy. So important that we learn how to deal with people who are hurting rather than being a Eliphaz or a Bildad. Notice verse 18, he will not allow me to catch my breath, but fills me with bitterness. We, we talked about this in the second chapter that Job's disease, this condition that he had that resulted in the boils and stuff, had a lot of peripheral problems with it. One was that he could barely breathe. And the second was not a physical problem, but it was an emotional problem. Job reminds us here that he's just overwhelmed with bitterness. At one time he was filled with joy. And now he says, because of what God has done with me, 
I'm bitter. I wonder how many bitter Christians are filling churches around the world, blaming things on God, and not understanding that there's always more going on than meets the eye. Not understanding that God is getting a bad rap for something that God did not do. Verse 19, he says, If it's a matter of strength, indeed, he is strong. And if of justice, well, who will appoint my day in court? Though I were righteous, my own mouth would condemn me. Though I were blameless, it would prove me perverse. I am blameless, yet I do not know myself. Interesting, in verse 19 and verse 20, he basically says, listen, it, you know, if it's a matter of strength, indeed, he's strong. You know, is this a contest? Okay, God, you win. You know, if it's a matter of justice, well, I mean, listen, who's going to allow me to go to court and make an accusation against God? It's, it, it's not like that. And then he says, listen, even if I were righteous, even though I am righteous, verse 20, my own mouth would condemn me. If I try to stand in the presence of God and talk about my own righteousness, I'm, I'm only going to condemn myself. He says, though I were blameless, in other words, though I am blameless, it would be perverse. It would be the wrong thing to do to stand in God's presence and talk about my righteousness. And then verse 21, he does. He goes, I am blameless, yet I do not know myself. I, I wish that more of us would take that attitude from time to time, especially when we're having conflict with others. We always want to say, listen, I'm the one who's right here. And then Job goes and he says, yet I do not know myself. How many of us really know ourselves? You know, every once in a while when Kelly and I are talking and we're, we're having those deep conversations and we're really kind of getting deep, what, what comes out, I realize I'm not who I think I am. A lot of times, I, I just think that, you know, I'm, I'm pretty great. And I think people around me think I'm pretty great. And then I get to talking to people and I realize, I guess I just don't know myself because <laughs> they don't think I'm nearly as great as I, you know what I'm saying, I don't really think that, but that's Job's. He says, man, I'm blameless, yet I don't even know myself, you know. Maybe there's something going on, maybe God sees something that I don't see. And then here, hang on to your hat because here comes another emotional swing and this one's bad. Job just goes from this place where it seems like the Holy Spirit is ministering to him. He's hearing from the Lord. He's speaking godly words. And then all of a sudden, that pendulum swings to the bad side. And he says, I despise my life. It is all one thing. Therefore, I say he destroys the blameless and the wicked. Look at how Job is thinking about God based on what his friends have said. First of all, he says, I, I, I just hate my life. Back to chapter 3. I just wish I was dead. And then he says here, this is what I've learned about God as of late, is that God just does whatever he wants to do. He, he destroys innocent people along with wicked. Verse 23, if the scourge slays suddenly, you know what a scourge is, like a, a, a whip, something that you punish somebody with. He, he says if the punishment comes upon you suddenly, God laughs at the plight of the innocent. God just seems to be this sick guy up in the sky who seems to enjoy punishing innocent people. And then verse 24, the earth is given into the hand of the wicked. Job says, you know, up until I went through this trial, I used to see that righteous men led the world and righteous men sat at the gates and they passed righteous judgment on certain situations and they handed out righteous, you know, judgments on situations the wicked were punished, the righteous were vindicated. And he says now, he covers the faces of the judges. If it is not he, who else could it be? In other words, God is not who I thought he was. Because I'm a righteous man, I have not sinned. Maybe I've done little things wrong, but, but I can tell you that you could examine the movie of my life and you would say, Job, you do not deserve, nor did your kids deserve this kind of stuff. And, and based on what my counselors are telling me here, God is not trustworthy. He's, he, he, yeah, he's not who we thought he was. And then notice this last little phrase. He says, if it is not he, who else could it be? How interesting. Job is doubting everything that he just said. He said, if it's not God that's doing this to me, 
Who is it? You see, there's always more going on than meets the eye. And Job realizes, man, God is, is really working me over. But then he gets this thought, why would God be working me over? I don't deserve this. I, I haven't done anything to provoke him. Who else in this universe could do this? But see, we have chapter 1 and we have chapter 2. We understand there's always more going on than meets the eye. Job did not have this insight. Job did not understand that Satan was at work here. Bildad did not understand that Satan was at work. Eliphaz did not understand that Satan is at work. That's why it's so important that we understand what James meant in chapter 3 of his little epistle where he talked about demonic wisdom and he talked about godly wisdom. He talked about heavenly wisdom. He talked about earthly wisdom. And so often Christians, you start listening to them and you think, where in the world did you get that? Listen, when you have a Christian using words like, well, it only makes sense. Listen, that's earthly wisdom. Nothing makes sense. Have you ever noticed that nothing makes sense? If someone comes along and says, listen, it only makes sense that James says that earthly demonic wisdom is sensual. It makes sense. It appeals to the senses. Wisdom that comes down from above, it's peaceable and it's pure. And eventually it, 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 it ends up in this harvest of righteousness. Peaceable fruits of righteousness. Do you see any peaceable fruits of righteousness coming from Eliphaz or Bildad's counsel? Or do you see a man who's ready to jump off a cliff? Amen, right? Notice what he says here. Um, verse 25, now my days are swifter than a runner. They flee away. They see no good. They pass by like swift ships, like an eagle swooping on its prey. In just one sentence, what Job is saying here is that my life is slipping away. He says, God has allowed me to go to a place where I'm going to die soon. My, my body cannot handle this. My spirit cannot handle this. If I don't die of a broken heart, I'm going to die of this disease. But Job says, I'm almost dead here. And verse 27, if I say I will forget my complaint, I will put off my sad face and wear a smile. I am afraid of all my sufferings. I know that you will not hold me innocent. If I am condemned, why then do I labor in vain? If I wash myself with, a snow, with snow water and I cleanse my hands with soap, yet you will plunge me into the pit and my own clothes will abhor me. Can I just say Job's in a bad place? D do you see what he's saying? He's basically saying, you know, I could pretend that everything's okay. I could just not question what's going on. I could continue just appealing to my own righteousness. But the bottom line is that I feel like I'm just going to be condemned anyways. I could try to cleanse my hands with soap. I could wash my clothes with snow water. Yet, I think that God might just throw me into the pit anyways. And he, he's just at a bad place. He, Job is at this place where he says, I just, I've lost it. I, I cannot even wrap my head around why God would allow this. And then this amazing, beautiful truth comes out of his mouth. Verses 32 through 35. And you're probably familiar with this. This is one of the more maybe popular portions of the book of Job. Verse 32, Job says this, For he is not a man as I am, that I may answer him, and that we should go to court together. Nor is there any mediator between us who may lay his hand on us both. Let him take his rod away from me, and do not let dread of him terrify me. Then I would speak and not fear him, but it is not so with me. This amazing prophecy of Jesus comes out of the mouth of Job in the midst of his deepest suffering. And, and he says a couple of things. He says, you know, he is the perfect God in heaven, and I'm just this imperfect man here on earth. And, and he can see me, and he can communicate with me. He knows everything about me, but, but I can't see him. I can't really communicate to him. I can't understand him. There's this gulf in between us. And Job says, you know what I really need? I need a mediator. Someone who could just reach out and put one hand on God and one hand on me and bring us together in reconciliation. It's not that I would then take God to court and make him explain himself. It's that this mediator would come and he would bring us together because of the conflict that exists 
And you know what he was doing as he was describing the ministry and the work of Jesus? The Old Testament talks about this mediator time and time again, but never names him. And then the New Testament comes along. We get to meet him. And in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, Timothy receives this letter from Paul. And Paul writes that there's one God and there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. We've got the gospel message hidden in the book of Job here that mankind needs a mediator. And this mediator would reach out and touch a holy God with one hand and touch sinful man with the other. Kind of looks like a cross, doesn't it? And then there would be a reconciliation of an entire race back to God if they would just put their faith in him. And now Job, he's, he's been speaking to Bildad in chapter 10. We get to see the words that Job speaks to God. And, and Job is still at a very low place. His pendulum is still swinging pretty, pretty strongly to the emotionally unstable side. And in chapter 10, verse 1, he says, my soul loathes my life. I hate life. I, I cannot even bear thinking about going on. And he says, I will give free course to my complaint. I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. Can you say, uh-oh? Remember in Proverbs we looked at last week, the fool vents all of his feelings, but the wise man holds them back, right? What, what Job is saying here, he's saying, things are so bad, I have no hope. I don't really care what happens, so this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to give free course to my complaint. I'm just going to let it all out. I, I don't care what happens. And he says this, I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. And a lot of this bitterness came from his counselors. It came because he needed to be comforted. He needed to be understood. He needed to be loved. And rather than that, he was completely rebuked. And this prayer reflects not only what a bad place he was in, but I got to share the opposite of this. At least Job was praying. At least he was pouring out his heart. You know, oftentimes when we're really going through heavy times, I, I got to tell you, I struggle to pray. And one of the reasons is I'm just fearful of of the fact that I might just say something I regret. You know, every once in a while I'm just so frustrated or so upset or I'm hurt or, or hurting or whatever it is. And, you know, I pray about praying. I pray before I pray. Okay, God, I want to meet with you, but I sure don't want to pull a Job chapter 10. So, Lord, I'm just going to sit silent for a while. I'm going to listen. I'm going to exercise listening in your presence, and then later I'll pray. Job, at least he's just pouring it out. Look what he says. I will say to God, verse 2, do not condemn me. Show me why you contend with me. Does it seem good to you that you should oppress, that you should despise the work of your hands and smile on the counsel of the wicked? Do you have eyes of flesh or do you see as man sees? Are your days like the days of a mortal man and your years like the days of a mighty man that you should seek for my iniquity and search out my sin? Although you know that I am not wicked and there is no one who can deliver from your hand. Man, did his pendulum swing in just that one? Whoo, whoo, whoo. You know, he's talking all these biblical truths about how powerful God is. And in the same sentence, he's shaking his fist at heaven, isn't he? <laughs> I like this. He just basically says, you know, God, I am crying out for answers, yet you continue to ignore me. But I understand this, God, it's not in your character to punish a righteous man, and it's not in your character to let a wicked man go, you know, unpunished. And I don't understand what's going on. Why are you treating me this way? And then verse 8, and this is beautiful. Man, if you, if you ever need a couple of minutes where God's Word will just tell you how precious you are, go read these verses. I'm going to slow down as I read this. Job says to God, your hands have made me and fashioned me an intricate unit, unity. He says, God, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. You, you know me. You love me. You knit me together in my mother's womb, as Jeremiah indicates to us. He says, I'm this intricate unity. All these systems work together to create my life and my body. And he says, yet you would destroy me. Why would you work so hard to put me together only to take me apart? And he says, remember, I pray that you have made me like clay. In, in other words, you've molded me and you have shaped me into what you wanted me to be. 
And will you turn me into dust again? Did you not pour me out like milk and curdle me like cheese? You ever heard that? Well, pour me out like milk and curdle me like cheese. I've heard people say that. This is where it comes from. And think about it. What he's saying, pour, pour me out like milk. I started like this liquid. But Lord, when I became what you really wanted me to be, it was this process of curdling into cheese. I just, you know, milk's not all that precious, but cheese is really good. And, and it takes time and it takes work for milk to be turned into cheese. And God, you turned me into something more precious than what I was before, more valuable than what I was before. And then he says, clothe me with skin and flesh and knit me together with bones and sinews. God, didn't you take, I was this spirit. I, I, I existed in your mind, I was this spiritual being, and then you built this body for me to live in. You built this life for me to live. You've granted me life, and you've granted me favor, and your care has preserved my spirit. Lord, there was this long season where you took such good care of me. I, I was prospered. I was blessed. I had 10 kids. I had a huge, thriving empire called my business. And these things you have hidden in your heart. I know that this was with you. If I sin, then you mark me and will not acquit me of my iniquity. That's the result of his counselors giving him bad counsel. In other words, you know, God doesn't like sinners. God doesn't ever forgive sinners. He's never going to acquit you, Job. He says, if I'm wicked, woe to me. Even if I'm righteous, I cannot lift up my head. I'm full of disgrace. God, see my misery. If my head is exalted, you hunt me like a fierce lion, and, and again you show yourself awesome against me. You renew your witnesses against me, and you increase your indignation towards me. Changes and war are ever with me. And in a sense, he's just basically saying, God, you, you took the time to carefully create me. You turned my life into something that glorified you, and then like a lion, you turned on me and you shredded me. And he says this at the end. He says, changes and war are ever with me. I used to have peace with you, God, and now it seems like my life is just one problem after another, and, and we're at war together. And in verse 18, Job makes another terrible mistake, one he's made before, and he asks the question, why? Verse 18, why? Why then have you brought me out of the womb? Oh, that I had perished and no eye had seen me. I would have been as though I had not been. How's that for some deep philosophy to chew on? God, if you would have never let me be born, I would have been as though I had not been. Job's a deep thinker here. He says, I would have been carried from the womb to the grave. He's back in a bad place. God, I wish you would have just let me die in my mother's womb. I wish that I could have just been born, stillborn, and, and then just buried immediately. Why did you put me through all this wonderful life only to let me go through this terrible stuff? Are my are my days few are not my days few? Cease. Leave me alone that I may take a little comfort before I go to the place from which I shall not return, to the land of darkness and to the shadow of death, a land as dark as darkness itself, as the shadows of death, without any order where even the light is like darkness. Look at verse 20. He says, it, he says God, I've only got a few days left. Th this disease is going to kill me, or my heart is just going to be broken. I'm going to die. So would you please cease this punishment, would you please just leave me alone that these last few moments of my life before I go to this place which I'm never going to reach, could I just have a few minutes of comfort? Could you just leave me alone? And then he says this, where even the light is like darkness. He thought he was going to have comfort in the grave, but as he begins to look at the grave, he says, I don't even think there's any comfort there. I just don't think there's any comfort. And that's the end of our study for tonight, until we just talk about this quick conclusion. Hear me. How many of you ever share your faith out there? I like to share my faith. I, I, I just love sharing the gospel. I like to find creative ways. How many of you like counseling one another within the church? You, you just kind of thrive when someone walks up and says, really kind of having a tough time. You feel like that's when my gifts come out. 
I just, I thrive being able to encourage others. Bildad kind of thought he was that guy. You know, I'm the guy just always talking about the Lord. I'm the guy that just seems to thrive when someone's going through a tough time. I just, I'm able to just look deeply into their soul, figure out everything they're doing wrong and correct them so that they can get back on track with the Lord. And I'm just thinking to myself, Bildad, stay away from me. Because when I'm having a bad day, it's already bad enough in here. I don't need you coming and condemning me, right? Well, body of Christ, when someone's going through a deep, deep trial, don't read this portion of the book of Job before you go talk to them. It's not a blessing to them at all. Rather, what I'd really, really like to see, what I, what I do see here, is that believers are supposed to be prayerful. They're supposed to be led of the Holy Spirit when they're ministering to people that are going through trials. That's not the time to rebuke. That's the time to encourage. It's the time to build up. Cry with them. Sit with them. Spend more time listening than talking. How many ears did God give you? How many mouths did God give you? Figure that one out, right? When somebody is hurting, use those proportionately. Listen twice as much as you talk, right? And then remember that Job's emotions really caused his pendulum to swing from one extreme to the other. How important it is when you and I are going through deep things that we spend a little bit more time in prayer and in the word than talking and spouting off. Because when we do that, normally what comes out is, is not good. When we are in a deep trial, we need to be in prayer, we need to be in the Word, and we need to be among Spirit-filled believers as we navigate these trials. And then the last thing tonight is that Job allowed his emotions and his bitterness to guide his prayer life. Did you see that in chapter 10? Job's prayer life was fueled by his bitterness. That's not what our prayer life is supposed to be about. And, and let me ask you, did you see Job asking God for anything tonight? I did. And the things he asked him for were, kill me, take me to the grave. Lord, I'm praying that you could go back in time and maybe never allow me to be born. He was praying things that what if God had answered some of these? And where I'm going with this is that oftentimes, if we don't pray properly, then afterwards, we need to thank God for unanswered prayers, don't we? Because later in this book, Job is going to be so happy that God did not answer these prayers because guess what? God is going to prosper him. He's going to thrive. He's going to have more children. He's going to have more than he ever had before. All because God is patient and refused to answer the prayers of a man who is in a bad place. That comforts me because God is so good. Father, thank you for the book of Job. Jesus, thank you for being our mediator. Lord, I learned a lot studying for tonight. And I learned that you are so compassionate. And oftentimes, Lord, we believers are so judgmental. We're self-righteous. We think we are so smart. We think we're the Holy Spirit sometimes. And when someone comes to us and they tell us of a trial they're going through. All of a sudden, we run it through this little matrix that we've put together in our brain. And we come up with something that sounds spiritual, it sounds wonderful, but it's usually far from comforting. And it's usually far from accurate. I want to pray that you would teach us to be able to listen. And Lord, even if we do see sin, and things that need to be corrected, that, that we would learn that your timing is just as important as your will. And Lord, I want to pray that we would learn from Job's comforters what not to be, and that we would learn as we watch Job grow how to seek you and how to come to a place, Lord, where the deepest trials and the deepest hurts Bring us to a true revelation of who you are. As we get into the final chapters, Job will say, I had heard of you with the ear, but now I have seen you with the seeing of my eyes. And Father, for those who are suffering and going through deep trials and just tough times, remind them tonight that 
This is the way that you bring us to maturity. I just have this burden on my heart tonight, Lord, as we're talking about this mediator hidden in Job chapter 9 to just bring up the gospel message that each of us came into this world as sons of Adam. We were born physically alive, but we were spiritually dead because of the sins of our forefathers that were passed to us in our DNA. We call it original sin, Lord, and it keeps us separate from you. And if we die with that original sin, we spend eternity in a lake of fire separated from you. But Lord, when we confess that sin, when we turn from it, when we ask forgiveness, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. We're guaranteed to spend eternity with you. And that very moment, life eternal begins and we begin to be transformed. And I pray for anybody in this room tonight, Lord, that needs to respond to the gospel message, that needs to give their life to Christ. Pray that they would be bold and make a decision tonight and say, this is the night I'm going to learn to follow Jesus. I'm going to make that choice. So Jesus, forgive me and fill me with your spirit and begin me on my path of eternal life. And I know there will be trials, so give me your spirit in abundance Teach me to yield to him that I could be a disciple. And Lord, as we continue studying Job, teach us to be better at loving one another. Teach us to be better at knowing you, God. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.